The Low Post is brought to you by Goodyear, helping you discover the road ahead. Goodyear, more driven. And now, The Low Post. Welcome to The Low Post podcast, where the season is now somehow one week away. And all of a sudden, by hook or by crook, there's an actual interesting and maybe good basketball team in New York City, the greatest city in the world. And it sure as hell ain't the Knicks. It's the Brooklyn Nets. And to help us preview what could be a soap opera, what could be a championship season, what could be a season that unfolds as much on Instagram as it does on the basketball court, the one and only Sarah Kustak of the S Network and many other places. How are you, Sarah? Zach, it's so good to see you. It's so good to speak with you. This makes my day. I don't know if it makes your day, but it makes my day. You are legitimately the most positive person that I know. If you, if if I could have you as an app, just talking to me when I feel down, <laughs> like just record three hundred affirmations by Sarah Kustak, and it, it would it would just make my day. This may be hold on to that thought. That may be my next profession. Well, I've already my I, side hustle. We all I'm need. Always, I'm I'm a phone call away, but I'm honored to be on the low post. This is a big deal. This is a big I don't, deal for me. If, if you had told me you were going to wear a Yankees hat, I probably would have canceled the appearance, especially oh. since you're from Chicago. I don't understand what what the – well, I guess you work for the – you work for the S Network. I, I See, I don't – I forget these things. And the people can't see, and now all my beloved Chicago family and friends know that I have a Yankees Good. hat. Good. You know what? Thanks. Good. I hope they do. I Did hope you – is that – what is that an all-star Chicago can you're drinking out of? What is that? It's not a can. It's a water bottle. Does you guys just have a can? Like I'm just drinking out of like, like a, a can. It's a – yeah, I did I not know. go to – I did not go to COVID Fest uh, 2020 in Chicago. I just – I got the water bottle sent to me, so I have a nice water bottle. Okay. Let's talk about the Nets, Sarah. Um Really, I didn't do a lot of digging into last year's numbers because who cares? Kyrie missed half the season. Kevin Durant missed the whole season. Um, I They had their first preseason game the other day. You were there. You got to watch it in an NBA arena, which to me, you won the lottery. I don't know when I'm going to do that again. Maybe soon. So just you saw it up close. How did Kevin look? Kevin looked excellent. And I think as we continue to layer these things, uh, a preseason game, a depleted Washington Wizards team that a lot of their top players weren't playing, I I think that's where all eyes, the enthusiasm and excitement, just for Kevin himself. Kevin is a individual who has poured so much sweat and effort into getting back after not playing for 18 months. You're just thrilled for him as a person and for all of us as basketball fans uh, to see his greatness back on the court. And I think the small things in his movements, in his lack of any type of hesitation, getting on the ground, taking a charge, you know, that was a big thing we were talking about, the charge that he took and the catch and goes that he had, the explosiveness to the basket. Uh, You knew that shot was not going to change. You knew that the, the beauty of how he can score on the floor was going to replicate a lot of what we saw before. But he looked like Kevin Durant. And to say that he looked like Kevin Durant I think is a such a just positive sign for Kevin himself and for this Brooklyn Nets team. Yeah, I, I wrote this when he got injured, and it's like it's some it's it's obvious, but sometimes you have to say the obvious. Like Kevin Durant's not just an NBA superstar, right? I mean, they're like Clay Thompson's an NBA superstar, right? Unbelievable player. What is probably a four time, five time All Star. Kevin Durant is a giant. Kevin Durant is a historical giant who has twenty three thousand points already by age 30, was on pace with good health to like be the third or fourth leading scorer in the history of the league. He's already, I dug up some stat yesterday, um, he's about to become, I think, the seventh player ever with 22,000 points, 6,500 rebounds, 3,000 assists, 1,000 steals, and 1,000 blocks. And he's the only one among, all the rest of them are big men, like Garnett, Duncan, Nowitzki. He's the only one who shoots threes. And by the way, he's like a 50-40-90 guy almost every season, like right on the border. Like he's missed it by a percentage point on free throws and threes like multiple times. He's He was on pace to be, and maybe he still will be, one of the 10 greatest players of all time. And like with an outside shot, not even an outside shot, with good health and longevity, like maybe crack in an even loftier discussion than that. Like that's who this dude is. And if he is 90% of what he used to be, 95, is that getting greedy? 95? 
I really think this team is being underrated because everyone is obsessed with the soap opera. And I don't think the two stars are helping uh, push people away from the soap opera aspect of this. Okay. But I think this team can win the championship. I don't think they're the favorites. I think the Lakers are the clear favorites. I think this team can win the East. They can win the championship. I think they're that good. And I think they are sneakily super, super deep. And we can talk about that. But if there's a season to be super deep, this is the season. I will dig into that a little bit more later because I do think the depth every time I've spoken about this team, the word versatile comes up and the versatility in the the rotations. You could look at the lineups, how you want to play and how Steve Nash and this coaching staff want to play. But the depth and in a year where that's going to be so necessary, I do think they have that. And I think maybe it's not as evident for those who have not, um, you know, understandably. So maybe you watch this team and watch some of these players throughout the course of the last couple of years. But when it comes to Kevin Durant, I'm glad, Zach, I expected you to bring all the numbers. So I, I'm glad, I'm glad you had the numbers. I'm glad you had the stat because it's, it's endless when it comes to Durant. But I think even watching him, um, his ability, his ability to get out and run, like how he was in transition, how you're moving and running through traffic, uh, his ability to embrace contact, initiate contact. To me, all of those things are like the small little aspects when you're, deciphering between 90 percent 95 percent is he at what point that type of stuff i think catches up with you and matters with how he's going to look as the season progresses and i also think just you know you could hear it in his voice after the game and he laughed and joked and talked about being anxious and and nervous and yeah of course he felt that way i I was i was nervous watching him i still haven't wiped the image of him falling over on the right sideline i've said this where i can remember exactly where i was I can close my eyes and see from my press seat in Toronto to where he was. I still haven't blotted it out of my head. I never will. And he had us into that point. He had a similar play like a catch and go play like that. That I'm like, dang, that's that's almost similar and incomparable to that same play. So if he's if he's willing to make that with the same acceleration, the same explosiveness off of that Achilles, to me, that's a positive sign. And that type of stuff is is where I think, as all play, you know, players who have been certainly not at this level, but I I I would never compare myself um, or just how it feels. But I tore my calf, and I'll never forget just the games coming back from after having a tap, calf tear and how you look at things. But he got a ton of runs. We know it's been eighteen months, so a ton of runs, pick up games. He was playing out in L.A. Every player you talk to said uh, he looks like Kevin Durant. He's a like this is this is who he is but that's not the same as then coming to a practice the flow of the game is not the same as a preseason game nor will it be the same as a regular season game or when you get to the postseason but I think this next step for him was really crucial probably for him and his feel and his confidence in his body and and to your point when I hear stuff like that about KD and John Wall about how great they look in pickup games in LA or whatever I it's good like as a data point it's good I don't particularly put a lot of stock into it because it's not game 31 of a compressed regular season. Uh, Now, to that point, I'm assuming, I don't know how much Steve has addressed this, I'm assuming that they're going to be very gentle with Kevin and Kyrie in terms of like back-to-backs and just playing the long game for the playoffs with these guys. That's, again, one of the benefits of depth and having two guys in Levert and Dinwiddie that we'll talk about that I think fancy themselves with some justification as able to run an NBA offense for a prolonged period of time. Um, one of the luxuries of that is if Kevin, if you feel like Kevin Durant should play 50 games, you can do that. If you feel like Kyrie Irving, who has been injured a lot, should play 50 games, you can do that. Yeah, and Steve has not addressed it directly. Uh, But I do think there's just taking the temperature of, okay, where are they at at this point? Heading into the game, the first preseason game, he said, we'd like to, ideally, we'd like to have them somewhere around 20 minutes. And I think Kyrie ended up playing about 17 or so. Kevin was somewhere around 25. Uh, But I do think it's a constant conversation, as is, I think, with many players between performance staff, between the player, between uh, the head coaches. And I think after everything Kevin has been through, and I'm sure same thing goes with Kyrie, uh, what he has been through with injuries and dealing with that, that they they have a good understanding of their bodies, but a good understanding that what they're playing for is the postseason. That's, that's what it's about. So whatever we need to do to stay healthy throughout the course of the regular season is what we're going to do. 
Well, and depth is nice, right? Depth is handy. It's nice. It helps in the regular season. It helps in the playoffs, too. I actually think the Lakers' depth showed up for them in this last playoff run. I think depth is actually a little bit... It is true that your top eight and you're really your top three win in the playoffs, but there are moments and quarters and whatever where like you need guy 11 to make a couple of shots that can swing a quarter, that can swing a game, that can swing a series. So depth is important, but the stars win. And like we've seen the movie when Kyrie is the best player on the team. It's not going to get you anywhere. Like he's a good player. He's a really good player. He's a great player. He's just not going to be the best player on a team that goes anywhere serious. Kevin Durant is. And if, I mean, he's a two-time, his, his resume speaks for itself. If, if he's not old Kevin Durant, then the ceiling on this team is lower. If he's 95% of it, I, I do think they can win the championship and or contend for the championship. But let's talk about the depth. They started in preseason game number one, and their second game is tonight, correct? They play tonight? Friday. Fr- Friday? What day is it today? Tuesday? I, time has lost Tuesday. all meaning. I don't care. I, you know, I didn't I know if already... you were playing a podcast trick of when this was getting released no it's getting released today i don't i don't care when uh no friday friday so they're only they they opted to play two preseason games so Uh, some teams i think you can play a max of four um so they are playing two so they played sunday and now they'll play they'll play at boston on friday they started Kyrie, joe harris spencer dinwiddie kevin durant deandre jordan are we assuming that's the starting five in the regular season I think things are very fluid. That is what Coach Nash has said, and I actually think that's the truth. What we had been alluded to, um, and I I really like the idea of it, is prior to the game, so Karis LeVert did not play because Mm -hmm. of right knee tendinopathy uh, day-to-day. Tendo what now? Tendinopathy. So that's different. We used to say tendonitis. Is that different than tendonitis? I don't know. I know nothing about the actual injury. I just learned how to say it. And I, I'm not going to lie. Thanks. I, I mispronounced it on the broadcast uh, Friday. And one of the great members of our net sports performance team uh, was giving me a hard time through text. So now I know how to say it. Just say knee soreness or, you know, like. like exactly. I, learned, I learned a new word. Let, let me Let me say it. Okay. All right. Point being, Karis LeVert did not play. However, um, Steve Nash did prior to the game in, in discussing this and in following days uh, has talked about the fact that they kind of like the idea of potentially Karis LeVert playing that Manu Ginobili role. That, I was going to say, know, he's, we, he, he, he said the M word. He said the M word. He which, said which, Manu. Which he makes said Manu. My, which, that makes my ears perk up. Manu is one of my all-time favorite players. First of all, be, let's be careful. Let's be careful. Manu is a savant. He's a genius. Okay, let's be careful. I get I what he's, but that. I get what he's going for. Steve's throw. <laughs> Steve is 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 throwing a lot of love into the world. That's a yeah. lot of love to Karis. <laughs> he's gone out of his way to give Spencer so much love. Spencer, I love Spencer. Didn't what he Spencer is amazing. He should be an eight time All Star. Steve didn't really say that, uh, but he's clearly preparing these guys for. You both are going to have to sacrifice. One of you likely in a Manu Ginobili style role for us to get where we need to go, which I think is is a, it's true. It's just true. Like one of them, they're they're not all going to play together, and they're not all going to get to do what they want to do. Agreed, and I love it because I'm someone who is often accused of sharing and spreading too much love or overhyping people. So I'm all in on Steve Nash, in, in, including and- by <laughs> including you're accused of that by me. You know what, though? When it's real, when it's facts and it's truth, uh, keep rolling with it. But to that point, um, and I think for for whatever reason, there was a natural assumption uh, throughout the course of the offseason or just in talking about this group when they get back together. I think there was a natural assumption that that would be Spencer Dinwiddie. And I'm not exactly sure why. Uh, Maybe because he more is your typical point guard or plays that point guard role and the way that Karras has played when he's caught a rhythm and gotten healthy what he did throughout the course of the bubble uh however I, I think the mindset is when they talked about the Nets third star it was always could this be Karras Levert which very well it could be uh but I also think when you're looking at how you want to play guys and who's finishing games is the important aspect of it uh, Steve Steve addressed the fact that they really like Karis LeVert. His ability to play make, it'll give him more reps with the ball in his hands. That's obviously the the 
issue you look at when you're on the floor with Kevin and with Kai is is how much time do other players have to really create and do some of the things that are their strengths. And so um, I, I don't know, and I can see that happening. I also think just we, we look at the uniqueness of the season, and we touched on it with – with COVID, with how things will go, the depth, I, I'm not sure you're always going to have the same starting lineup. I'm not sure this is going to be a year that you're set with five guys. However, I do think that's going to be something to watch, just where they're using Spencer, where they're using Karras, and also the feel-up. I mean, this has been a short – this has been a quick turnaround of a off season and preseason um, and just how much time Steve Nash and this coaching staff have had to evaluate how guys fit together. Um, so to answer your question, do I anticipate, you know, Kevin Kyrie, Joe being in there? Absolutely. Um, and DeAndre, yes. And that's, that's, that's another, you know, topic uh, to take a look at Jared Allen, DeAndre Jordan, Jared Allen spent most of the time starting last year. DeAndre started the last few under Jock Vaughn. Um, Jared Allen was a, a monster in the bubble. And who feels most comfortable in in that role or how they fit that role, how they're using a big, how often they play small. So I think that goes back to there's a lot of questions, which I don't think are of major concern for the staff, because I think, as we know, in this league so much of it is about how guys fit together throughout the course of a game and, and what your closing lineup looks like yeah closing is more important than, than starting right that said i don't think i would be very curious to see at the end of the year how often Kyrie, Kara, spencer and kevin are all on the floor together all four of them i bet it's going to be less than people anticipate because it's just do you think do you I, think I, whatever people's guess is I, even last season even last season with all the injuries Kyrie. Spencer and Karras only played 67 minutes together the entire season. I think they just want to spread that ball handling. Like I like we can talk about, you know, they've Steve has talked about using Durant at center here and there, which we'll see how much they use that lineup. I mean, they have two starting level centers on their team that, you know, and there's only 48 minutes. Like they may not play that card all that much. For what it's worth too, and we'll see, but I think it just makes it people have been talking really high on Reggie Perry. Played well and- the other night. Played well the other night, uh, but for a rookie and for someone who you would think you kind of, okay, spent a lot of time in Long Island, could be a I've been hearing a lot of buzz about him more so than I anticipated, for what it's worth. I still think he's going to spend a lot of time in Long Island. Yeah, um, for sure. <laughs> um, so, so you look at what that lineup would look like, right? Well, it obviously is going to have Kyrie in it, and it's going to have KD in it at center. Joe Harris, I just feel like, is a rock solid part of all these closing lineups. He could, he's one of the best shooters in the world. Good defensive player, like really underrated defensive player. He's in. That leaves me two spots. You could throw Karras and Spencer in there. You get real small, and I think defensively challenged. But then that's when you start to view, really think about how much depth this team has. Torian Prince is a good fit in that kind of lineup, and you and I are both sort of Torian. We're on Prince Peninsula. We're optimists yeah. that 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 Torian can I am. Re- rebound. I am. Landry Shamit, I think, was a really smart acquisition. Uh, Bruce Brown didn't play in the first preseason game. I don't really get that. I thought he could help. TLC, TLC, like, was shooting as if he was Clay Thompson in the bubble. Like, just jacking stuff up every and, like, making it. long rangey defender. Jeff Green thrived in this exact role in Houston as, like, a small ball center or whatever you want to call him. You know, and there there are other guys that we 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 don't even we haven't even named. Like we're up to like twelve good NBA players already. This team is super deep and super flexible. And I think like all those guys look. Some of those guys are going to go bust, right? Like it's there's maybe Bruce Brown has already gone bust in practice. I don't know what's going on with that. Maybe TLC shooting last season was fake. But like that's a lot of good NBA. Like none of these guys are like you put them on the floor and you're. Like oh crap I gotta I gotta I gotta roll with a, a guy who's a weak link or something. And and to your point, I think some of those names you put out and how they performed or how they performed recent, we've seen a level of inconsistency. So it's that type of evaluation. Okay, what are we gonna get, and how do you play alongside? You know, at the end of the day, how do you play alongside Kevin and Kyrie? I think it was important. You know, I can't imagine a closing lineup without Joe Harris, but to have Agreed. knockdown shooters on the floor um, when you have those two. And I also think that that turns, you know, to Spencer and to Karras, because I will say about both of those players, um, one such, I have always admired 
their unselfishness and how they approach their role, the position. Uh, they both have an extremely high level of confidence, but they also understand that they are willing to make sacrifices to win. Uh, but the big question with them is, is the catch and shoot aspect. And it's something that I'm curious to see. I can only imagine that they poured a lot of time and work in, you know, in what we did have in the offseason or what, into that aspect of the game. So can they get to a point? Because they, they, you see them in some games and they're consistently knocking down threes. And it's just not been consistent throughout the course of the season. So at what point is that aspect of their game improved? And can they improve that? And how does that affect the way in which you're, you're mixing and matching with these lineups? I am betting tepidly on we have not seen Karis LeVert's best three-point shooting season in the NBA yet. I think he can get better. So last year, he's career 34%. Last year, he's 36%. And as you know, Sarah Kustak, because you are a student of the game um, and one hell of a player, by the way, um, his numbers are weird in that his pull-up threes are way better than his catch-and-shoot threes. You can spin that as... Well, that means catch and shoot threes are a weakness and pull up threes are a strength. I spin it the other way where he's making the tougher looks at a at a high rate. And that suggests to me that when the easier looks get even easier because Kevin Durant's on your team and Kyrie Irving's on your team, I, I just don't see what mechanically or anything would be the reason why those catch and shoot looks can't get up to 38% or something like that. Like, I, I think... I think he's going to sh- – look, shooting is unpredictable, right? You have one bad month and your whole numbers are skewed for the season. So who knows what this prediction is worth. I'm kind of optimistic he's going to have a good shooting season. I'm so and glad. And I know he, he's talked about it recently. I feel like he made comments about it recently, right? I'm so glad you said that. Um, and it's such an astute observation on your part um, per the usual because when you look at Karis LeVert and Spencer Dinwiddie, and I, I've said this on multiple they, – they used to be options one and two or what you know option number one when they're on the floor. Um, same goes with Joe – who – is guarding them, who's defending them, the shots they're taking. A lot of the shots they were taking, the shot clock's winding down. you got to get a shot off. They're the ones that are going to take it. Um, the quality of looks that each of them are about to have on the floor is going to skyrocket. And Karis LeVert particularly, I feel like I was, you know, this is deja vu of things I've said throughout courses of the seasons and broadcast with him, even since he first came. He would have five game stretches or eight game stretches that he's putting up 30 points a game or he's putting up 25 or whatever. And it always comes back and is predicated on, oh, he's throughout the last eight games, he's shooting 45% from three. Throughout the last, you know, what it, same goes with Spencer Dinwiddie and where that has come with Karis, because I believe in, and I should have these numbers in front of me, and out of the, the two postseason, so in the bubble, and then that Philadelphia series um, last year or two years ago, however you want to look at it, uh, he shot like 45% or 50 close, somewhere from three. And I think some of that, too, is just him getting healthy. He's dealt with each year where he's missed, you know, a significant portion of time and you watch him for a couple of weeks trying to get his rhythm, trying to fit in, That's whether he's point. coming off the bench. And, and then all of a sudden something clicks. And we have seen this every year. And there's a point that, oh, something clicks. And then there's that type of consistency. So I think for a multitude of reasons, those are the things that I'm like, oh, you may be able to be optimistic that that will change or the consistency of efficiency or of what they're shooting may change. Um. And I love the point you just made about the Philly series, which feels like it was nine years ago, and the bubble. It's so like one thing I do like about Karras is he's got guts. He's not afraid. He he does not the big stage, the playoffs, the the Joel Embiid, Ben Simmons, whatever. whatever it, nothing scares him, and like that actually matters. So when we talk about Torian Prince and being on Prince Peninsula, this is a guy last year. I don't. I'm not. I don't think he was scared, but he was clearly mentally rattled by a new situation by superstar teammates giving him advice on how to play by the dissonance between the player that he's imagined himself to be in his head and the player that he now needs to be for the nets and like Karis just plays like he does like he's mentally super tough and Torian I think is actually a a sneaky important player on this team because if there's one ingredient that I look we can talk about should the Nets flip all this stuff for a third star maybe that's a conversation we should have had earlier but, <laughs> um, 
let's say they don't and they just roll with two stars and a lot of depth. The one the one thing that would make me feel a little better about their championship equity is another guy who can guard fours, like one of those three, four tweener forwards who can guard fours, like a kind of a backup four to KD, who I really, really trust. And do I trust Jeff Green to make enough shots? I'm not sure yet. Do I trust Torian to rebound from what was a, a really strange season for him? I'm not sure yet. But that's the spot where if, if one of those guys pops or has a good season, I think their I think their year is different. And Torian in particular, and, and it was a different year because I'm not sure, first of all, how, how Torian felt after leaving Atlanta and feeling like, I don't know if he felt a little bit like Atlanta gave up on him or didn't have the same level of confidence. So coming to Brooklyn, um, he had an excellent start, but there was the circumstance. And again, these are things, my my thoughts and perspective, I did not hear from him, but Wilson Chandler was suspended for 25 games of the season. So when he come back, came back, how he changed the dynamic um, in some ways that aligned with when Torian started struggling more from the field and then it was just a snowball effect. Eventually he was not starting. Uh, but I think for Torian, he's looked good early. He's coming with a sense of confidence. To your point, his ability to play multiple positions, which I think this is going to be so important for the team because in some ways I think, you know, will they play small or have Kevin or others at the one, you know, um, put green at that five spot. I, I, I think, think, I think look you, at it, you think Torian can. Well, just, I just think a, a lineup of Kyrie, Joe, Torian, Kevin, like Joe wing, big wing X and Kevin. And then a center, like that's super switchable two to two to four, which I really, really like. Yeah. And that's where, and that's where I think Torian too, just him going back and forth between playing the three, playing the four last year. Um, I think there's a lot of things that you, sometimes you assume that it should be an easy adjustment for guys or easy adjustment to play in a different system or what's happening. So I'm high on where Torian um, looks now coming in with the things you hear about him. And I think too, just you know, with all of these these players, I'm curious to see what happens defensively. I mean, that's that's the one area, you know, the, the big question mark of yeah. this team. Um, but what are they doing defensively? Because th- this is the crummy part of my current circumstances with COVID, haven't been able to be in practices or watch training camp or see some of the things, but what we're hearing from the guys, what we're hearing from Steve, they're really t- doing some unique things on the defensive end. And we saw a lot of switching uh, in that first preseason game, but those are the type of players, whether it's green, whether it's touring, those are the type of players that can become so valuable, particularly on the side of the ball uh, that you got deficiencies. Yeah. I think offensively, if Kevin is Kevin, they're going to be really, really good. And yeah. Kyrie, you, know, you can quibble with Kyrie's game. Like I'd like to, I'd like to, I'd like to redirect five percent of his shots from the mid-range to the rim. Like he doesn't get to the rim as much as you think he does, considering what a great finisher he is. But he's like he's an elite mid-range shooter. Like it's hard when you look at the numbers, it's like hard to quibble. He's an outstanding offensive player. Defensively, if they can get to tenth, I think they have a real chance to be a really dangerous team. Uh, I, let's ask the most important question. How are they? I mean, I guess you're not at practices, but you're around the team here or there at games. Like, are they, how are they dealing with the James elephant in the room? Are they just blocking it out? Are they, I mean, they, I just continue to hear there have been no real anything between the Rockets and the Nets. I, I'm not saying this just because it, it, it feels like the thing I should say is someone who calls games for the Nets. Um, I really don't see it as a distraction, especially at this point. It felt like the high level of buzz and discussion about it was, you know, two, three weeks ago when it first happened. Um, and I was not around the team then. I think it was right what at the start of training camp or a little bit before. And I, I'm not sure how um, things were playing out then. It seems a bit currently as a non-factor. Uh, Karis LeVert, in Kyrie Irving, Kevin Durant, they're tight. I mean, they are fr- they're friends on the court, but also off the court. And I think they have showered him with a high level of confidence. Same thing goes uh, with Spencer Dinwiddie. I, I think it has dissipated in terms of if, if even it was at all how it's affecting the locker room. You mentioned it. Steve Nash has done everything he can to to make sure to shower those guys with praise. And at, at the end of the day, Sean Marks and Steve Nash, two things I will say about them, um, and especially Steve early on now, why he's resonating with players. He's been in their shoes. Marks has been in their shoes. They get this. Um, 
are things always perfect? No, but do I think they are direct and communicative and honest with their guys? I do. And I think for that reason, uh, there is an understanding about the circumstances. I think it's a fascinating decision. These are the decisions that you get paid big bucks to make. Two stars in depth versus three stars in no depth. And there are, there, both models have won championships. Teams tend to defer to just get the stars because if I have three stars and one of them gets injured, I still have a chance. Um, I can trade the third star if it doesn't work out for all the draft picks and stuff that I traded out to get the other star. Um you know, I, I think offensively, James, Kyrie, and Kevin would be an incredible fit if 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 Kyrie is willing to take a, a third option kind of role, which TBD on that. By the way, how many post touches do you think Kyrie had last season? You, well, I was going to say something to you about that when you said that he's not at the basket enough. I was going to say clearly he doesn't think uh, so either. Post, I don't know. I was I was counting in the preseason game, and I don't think he got any post touches. He didn't even get a half. He didn't even get an in and kick out. I enjoyed KD's uh, professorial dismissal of the entire I subject matter. Lo- I, I, it warmed my heart, all of it, and the sincerity that felt like, because at first when it started, I was like, this is, they're obviously joking, this is a joke. Uh, yeah, what did Kevin say for the continuity of our offense? Yes, he was basically like, <laughs> was like you're bogging it down. Of We're our not offense, doing that. I don't think it's good that our point guard would want to be under the basket the whole time. Kyrie oh, Irving, Kyrie okay. had um, six post touches last year. That's in the whole total. season. Six total. In total. That's the whole. That's the whole season. Okay. Anyway, so that's a so that I just want apropos. Of, it's all ap- it's all negotiable. Apropos of nothing, um, uh, I do think they would fit offensively. Defensively, they take a hit. And look, if, if if the other argument is that when you're a good team, your depth. All these depth pieces get super expensive, right? So Karras has gotten paid. Jared's Jared's gotten paid. Joe's gotten paid again. Spencer's up for a new deal after the season. So like the depth is really powerful when they're on their cheaper contracts. That's no longer the case. But if Joe Sy just doesn't care, like if he'll just pay infinity luxury tax, then if he's the anti Fertita, then it just doesn't matter. Like who you can do we can build whatever kind of team you want. And if the Rockets just aren't interested, if the Rockets just don't care. If they don't care if they give you all the picks and all the swaps, they don't. if they don't even care if you give me the 20, 25, 26, 27 picks when Durant may be out of the league or not good anymore or whatever, if they just don't care, then there's just not a discussion to be had. And and like some of that will depend on does Philly come to the table with, with Simmons and does Team X come to the table with, you know, does Miami come to the table with Hero and everything and do the Rockets love Hero? If they just don't like the offer that the Nets can offer, then maybe – and Woj reported yesterday they don't even want Kyrie. I don't think the Nets would do that. Like, okay, clearly that's going – there are layers and layers of bureaucracy and politics to even making that a possible thing that appear untenable now. If there's just not a deal, there's not a deal. Now, the Nets – you can make up deals where the Nets go get a third player that – a third team to get a third young team. player yeah. that the Rockets want. But that's really complicated. Maybe there's just no deal. I kind of want the Nets to roll with this team because I'm interested to see how the two stars plus depth model holds up. I like that. It's an interesting model. I – and that's where – and I'm interested to see twofold on this. I would say I'm curious how much we will learn – how feelings or thoughts may change in perspective with the teams. Because I think both Brooklyn and Philadelphia, the start of these, there's a lot of questions and a lot of feel out to see what do these teams look like? What do the rosters look like? How does everyone fit together? It's not like you have a team that, that you know what you have, you know how it would fit it. I mean, I think Miami's a different circumstance of what you're willing to do, but you kind of know what you're working with. I don't think the Sixers and the Nets at this point feel like they know exactly what they're working with and you're not sure then what you're willing to put on the table. And I, I think that too, and I think that too, to your point about the Nets rolling with this, like I, I do think there is that sense of we don't have to, is James Hart is one of the top six players. Is he extraordinary? Absolutely. Would that be a blast watching the three of them on offense? Of course it would be. Nobody would um, be able to guard that team. If, if no. Kyrie buys into his role, th- that team is unguardable. Unguard- the only question is, do they have, depth to withstand an injury and can they can they play any defense uh and is james willing to play basketball again and not james ball um right but But but, in that uh, statement you said three ifs and then we don't know what they even look like now so that's um that's why i i think 
there a lot will be seen in these first few weeks of where those teams stand, where they think they stand, and just the potential of what they think they can reach with the groups that they have. I can't wait to watch this team play. You must be so excited to watch these teams, this team play after years I'm, of fun, frisky teams. Some yeah. not so fun, not so frisky teams. Last year, a weird season. The plague happens and is still happening. You must be so excited to watch this team, and you must be dreaming about watching it in a non-plague environment. It's I, I can't even imagine what that would be like. But I told you this before we start, to see live basketball in front of you, uh, let alone it be Kevin Durant and Kyrie Irving, it was extraordinary. It was. And, and there's something to be said for our discussions on James Harden, the third star. And all. I'm like, in some ways, when people have asked me this question, I'm like, that's just mind boggling to think where we were at even two seasons ago um, in calling games or the team that we were, you know, looking at and the enthusiasm you had for what they were doing on the floor and the, how hard they worked and the improvements they made. It's like, man, it's 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 been a big jump uh, in a very short amount of time. Well, it's good to see you, Ms. Kustak. Um, I look forward to waving at you from uh, the upper deck of the Barclays Center in the near future. Uh, and I say this frequently, and when you're not on this podcast, there is no better local broadcast experience in the NBA than the Nets broadcast, and you are a huge part of that. Uh, and now you have a team that is going to be worthy of a lot of nonpartisan eyeballs. So more and more people are going to be able to hear what you guys do on a night-to-night basis. Congratulations on that. I will see you soon. And uh, please stay safe, Ms. Gustak. I will see you, you. I'll the, see you at the arena. You're the best, Zach. Love to the family. Stay safe. And also, I wanted us to get into pie ratings. but Pie ratings? Time. Oh, pie. Oh, yeah, you're a pumpkin pie aficionado. Not a top 10 pie. Maybe not a top 20 pie. Number one pie? You want to hear the number one pie? Yeah. Key lime pie. Oh, I can give you that. Pumpkin isn't my number one. Key limes before it, coconut, lemon meringue. Lemon meringue's pretty good. Key lime is where it's at. You're the best, Zach. Thanks so much for having me on. All right, let's bring in uh, ESPN sideline reporter, writer, bubble <laughs> resident, maybe still in the bubble for all I know. She <laughs> might still be there. Uh, Malika Andrews has a wonderful profile of Giannis Antetokounmpo, who has six days to make, I don't know, just the biggest decision in the current NBA and maybe professional sports landscape. Malika, how are you? I'm Wow, that was quite the run-up, quite the intro. I tried. I, tried. I mean, no state tax. I, I wanted to vote in Florida, and they said no. Four months wasn't enough, so <laughs> I guess I had to come back to New York. But I'm doing well. How are you, Zach? I'm good. I do the grand, the grand destino. Could you just stay at the grand? Like, was was that would that have been the hotel of choice? Now all these hotel names are just like I'll always remember the yacht club for just like for the rest of my life. It's so I'll never be there. I'll just I'll never forget it. So I'm not sure I should admit this as a Disney employee and someone who grew up in California, but I've never been to any Disney property until I moved to Disney. So for me, that's that's entirely what it is. It's it's oh yeah, in college I lived in this neighborhood, and then I moved to sh- New York and Chicago, then back to New York, and then I moved to Florida for a stint. It, it's now just one of my permanent residences or former permanent residences. You you put in triple digits amount of days in the bubble, <laughs> so you. Should- should be able to yeah you should i think you should be able to vote in florida next time um so you have a profile of Giannis, and we'll get into the nitty-gritty of it it's on insider today and it's just about what makes this guy tick Mm. um as we opened with uh it's december 15th he has until december 21st the end of the day i guess to sign the supermax extension that i assume the bucks just have papered all over the facility just in case he happens to walk by <laughs> copies are everywhere like like chris middleton has signed it just in case he can get the money you yeah. know he can trick them into i don't know um and if he doesn't sign it then it's just going to hang over them the whole season uh my first question to you was was this so whenever i see a story like this i'm always curious was the, the idea like when he signs it, we drop it, and now it's like, well, we kind of just got to drop it because the season's <laughs> about to start. Like, what is the origin of this piece? Other than he's fantastically interesting and we should be writing about him a lot. So because he's fantastically interesting, this idea was actually something that Kevin Arnovitz and I have been talking about for – it It feels like two years. Kevin Arnovitz, friend of the podcast, fantastic writer for ESPN – But initially, we had talked about this story being something that would run in the run-up 
to the 2019-20 playoffs when they were scheduled to start in April. And I actually, right before the season shut down, right before that hiatus, I was on a stretch where I was bouncing around with the Bucks. I had like a four or five game stretch where I was with Milwaukee. And then that kind of crumbled because the, the season shut down due that to COVID. That sounds like a bad 80s sitcom. Malika Andrews <laughs> starring in Bouncing with the Bucks. I can see the opening credits to that. Yeah, with the bubble letters coming up. Yeah. Um, and and then it was a, okay, well, when the Bucks inevitably, uh, because they are so good in the regular season and, and this is the time that they're going to turn it around in the this, this postseason doom that they've endured for the last now two years. But when they were in the Heat series before Giannis got hurt, it was something that we were considering for, for that series. And then – what happened happened. They were an earlier exit than they were expecting. And then we pivoted to, okay, well, in, at some point in this season preview space, we're, we're going to be looking for a Yana story. Now's the time to do it. So the amount of drafts that poor Jim Merritt and Christina Daglas, our editors, have had to endure, I, I do feel a little bit bad for them. <laughs> well, the other thing is for you, the longer it gets delayed – because this happens to all of us, the more you feel like there's just infinite reporting you can do. Mm -hmm. Like you can dig up another anecdote. You can call yep. another person. You can, it's just like, it just never ends. Like at some point it just has to end. You just yep. have to do it and it needs to be in the world. Um, <laughs> That's why when people ask you if writing is fun, it's like, yeah, when it's published, when it's out there, the finality is fun. Everything leading up to that is just a, a head case. <laughs> Writing is is awful. Um, there, there's a reason why a lot of novelists appear to just like go crazy by the yep. end um, um, and, and all that. Well, the story is about um, Giannis's competitive fire and mm -hmm. how, like many superstars, he turns everything into a competition. I want to zero in and open with one scene that is not the lead. We can talk about the lead later. But one scene that's in the middle mm -hmm. is he's in Greece this, yeah. off, this past <laughs> offseason season. And he's practiced. The reason I want to get into it first is he's practicing. You describe him practicing two things that I think are massively important to the act, like to to the Bucks' chances of winning a championship. Right. One is his post game, and the other is his free throw shooting. Mm -hmm. uh, and and just like people are aware, I think that his free throw shooting has been an issue. Can I read you some stats about this? Some yes, very please. basic stats. Uh, regular season free throw percentage. 2017, 77%. 2018, 76%. 2019, 73%. Three straight mid 70s. 2020, 63%. Okay, just like, let's just. Yeah, there's just, a trend know, whatever. there. Well, what that? Maybe there is not a trend. Maybe it's random. Here's the trend playoff free throw shooting percentage. 2017, the year he shot 77%, 54%. 2018, 69%. 2019, 64%. 2020, 58%. Maybe it's random. A couple of those are one round and out playoffs, so the sample size is not very big, although he gets mm -hmm. to the he, he's, it's, he's not shying away from contact. He gets to the line seven, eight, 11, nine times a game. Right. But th that that might be a trend. Like something is happening to his free throw shooting in the playoffs. And look, 60% is still 1.2 points per possession. It's still the best offense in the NBA, blah, blah, blah. In the mechanics of the game, in the guts of a game, it does not feel like that when you're facing the Milwaukee Bucks and you're facing the two-time MVP. It feels like fouling him is okay for a defense. It feels like fouling him may uh, neuter a more dangerous outcome, an open three for somebody, a dunk, a drive. It just fe it feels like it stops their momentum. It lets it, it 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 lets you sort of pause the game. I think that's really interesting. So. Without spoiling your whole story, <laughs> please describe how Giannis is trying to improve his postseason high stakes, high leverage, <laughs> I'm fatigued free throw shooting because it is borderline psychotic. <laughs> There's a yes. So Giannis shows up at, at the gym in in Greece and the Bucks have sent several assistant coaches, different assistant coaches over the course of this offseason. I keep wanting to say summer, but over the course of the offseason to work with Giannis. And Giannis likes stakes. He likes something that he stands to lose because that fuels his competitive fire. And he 
could be most competitive with himself on the basketball court. So he's going to these workouts. He decides, you know, sometimes shooting free throws, like in the Bucks general practices day to day, is the end portion of practice. After everything is done, they break out into groups and shoot free throws. But that to him doesn't simulate how he feels in a game. He wants to shoot free throws when he is gassed, when he is most tired. So he does all of these exhaustive drills and then he goes to the free throw line, not to shoot five, six, seven, ten free throws, but just to shoot two, sometimes four. But he decides that he needs stakes for these free throws. And in so addition it, to being tired. In, in addition, addition to just being tired, in addition to just needing to improve them for the statistical reasons that you just said, he decides that his assistant coaches are going to have to run if he misses his free throws. And for Giannis, it's not about himself having to run. It's about having to watch somebody else endure what he has, in essence, put on to them, that it's his fault in some way. And so that happens. It's fine. But the stakes he decides aren't really high enough. And so his girlfriend, Mariah Riddle Springer and their infant son, their 10 month old son, Liam, come to the gym to watch him practice. Hey, let's watch that. Let's watch daddy. Yeah, let's, let's watch daddy. Let's, watch let's daddy. play off to the side in the bleachers. We're going to bring, you know, in the bubble, they brought a giraffe toy for him to game so he could play with it. And oftentimes he would end up falling asleep. Liam, that is. But the coaches and Giannis decide hey, you know what? How about if you miss this time when they're here, Mariah should run holding Liam and he misses. And so there's Mariah jogging up and down the sidelines. Uh, Jogging's not good enough. I want want (laughs) sprinting. I want this kid to be terrified by how fast his mom is running. He's just screaming with glee. Liam thinks it's the greatest thing ever. And, you know, Mariah is looking at Giannis like, oh, this is something that I can hold over you in the future because – Of course it is, because of course this family, Giannis has to bring the people he cares, the people he cares about the most into his free throw competitions. That's, that is Giannis. That is Giannis in essence. That is his off season, his cherished rituals of improvement also just so happened to include this a little bit insane added element to it. See, if I were her... (laughs) I would just say, no, I'm not doing that. So how about this? Instead of me doing that, I'll just be angry as if as if I had done it anyway. So I'll t- you'll get the emotional consequence of me being angry. And you have to clean the house for the next two weeks. And you have to cook dinner every single night. So let's just like you, st- you will bear the punishment on emotional and time management levels. And I won't run. That's it. But then like, we know, as as is in the story, Giannis can turn that into some sort of competition because that's how he grew up, is turning household chores into something that can be won and lost. Yeah, but now he's got money and he, and he <laughs> and like lots of money. And if I had lots of if I had that level of money, um, it's cleaning is just something I would opt out of completely. Like, I kind of like, like it. It's kind of cathartic for me. <laughs> see, I just have never reached that point with almost anything. It might mm-hmm. be because I'm a workaholic, and so I just think about other things I could be doing. People say that about people say that about running. No, no, that hurts my knees. Oh, haven't you got the runner's high? No, running sucks. It's the worst. <laughs> it's like literally my the only thought in my head when I'm running is how long until this is over. Yep. Uh, cooking, no. Partly because I screw up recipes. I'm not good at cooking. That's that's the problem. I want to be good at it. Cleaning, I excel. Maybe I have a little bit of this no, competitive see, streak in, in see, me. I, I cut I cut corners. <laughs> I cut corners. I'm not lifting up the couch to vacuum under the couch. I'm not yeah. getting like I'm not getting the grout see, that's what out the, of things the in the bathroom. It's for you. Got to get in there. But what you said about this this wasn't in the story on the the cutting room floor things that Giannis needs to – is it, that Bucks fans would be interested to hear that he's working on maybe. Giannis, the assistant coaches that were over there, had conversations with him where Giannis 
who is still a a student of the game is asking him asking them when you say when guys say get to my spot in the playoffs for me what do you think that means and dissecting that and his spot oftentimes isn't the traditional a lot of times you think of shooters right get to your spot get to your your shooting spot on the floor well Giannis is working to interpret that into what it means for his game and oftentimes that means post up situations that's that's his spot and his spot evolves and so he's kind of trying to figure out all of this language for his game and how to elevate it and make it better because oftentimes those possessions then lead to free throws. So maybe that's his spot. And then he's turning all of those things into competitions. See, that's why I want to talk about the post-ups because I I think, and I was not on the right side of this initially. I I was one of those people who was like, oh, if Giannis can ever shoot threes, it's all over. Like I get what the Bucks are doing by pushing him out there and letting him fly. He took like five a game and like, I, and there was a pushback among a lot of people inside the game saying that's the wrong approach mm. because no one is ever going to guard him there. He's never going to become a dangerous enough shooter that anyone's going to guard him. It's still going to be the same defense. It's still going to be guys waiting at the foul line for him. It doesn't matter. What he needs to do is get a go-to move where he can rise up from 15 feet or hone his post game because he's giant and really, really strong and can bulldoze almost anybody that's going to guard him. Yep. And I actually think those people were right. I, I think the Bucks' obsession with turning him into a competent three-point shooter was was well-founded and good-hearted and the wrong move for their playoff offense. Because if you boil down what's happened to them in, in the playoffs, and the Miami series was, series was a little different. Miami torched Milwaukee's defense, which had not really happened before right. in other series. But their half-court offense has failed against yeah. good defenses, two playoffs running, and failed badly. Failed badly against Miami. Just as an example, in the regular season last year, 35% of the Bucks' shots came at the rim. 39% of their shots came from three-point range. That's about 74, whatever the math is. Against Miami, that 30, what did I say, 35, 37% at the rim came down to 27% of their shots were at the rim. 36% of their shots were threes. They took a ton of mid-range shots. They just couldn't get what they wanted. And Giannis, if you look at the numbers on second spectrum, which track every post up and what happens when he posts up, Mm -hmm. he has been a mediocre post up player for most of his career. The numbers are just not good. Uh, They're they're just not very good. Last year, they ticked up 1.04 points per possession when he shot out of a post up or passed to a teammate who, who shot right away. That was like 25th out of like 95 guys who posted up 50 times or something like that. Like that's good. Points per possession was pretty good. So it's trending the right way. The previous years was just not good. And I think to me, you know, I always watch the Bucks and and I love when Giannis screens in the pick and roll because mm-hmm. he's just such a dynamic lob threat. They get switches that he should be able to bully in the post and he just hasn't been good enough making plays out of the post or scoring out of the post. He's getting better. And that is the kind of thing where I progress there would be, I think, more meaningful for the Bucks as a team than progress as a three-point shooter. Well, because that is potentially one of the spots, right, that he's talking about. Because, again, it's a, a classic term you use for, for, for shooters, for shooters of range, right? Get to your spot for Damian Lillard means anywhere past the logo. But for Giannis, that's kind of what he's learning. I do wonder when you're reading out some of those numbers, I think of the changes in his body just physically over the last couple of years. And you talk about how strong he is. Well, when he got into the league, right, he didn't look anything like, let alone sound anything like. He has changed and developed every year he's been in the league, probably until about, just physically, until about a year, two years ago, right? That's when he started to just consistently be looking the same. So now that he has that strength, now that he's kind of established that this is what his NBA body is going to be, now he's learning how to use it because putting him in post-up situations in that way when he was more spindly could have ended poorly. Spindly is such a great word. In fact, I was thinking of that word in my head as you were describing young Giannis, and you just you said it. It was it's a beautiful word, spindly, spindly. I'm tempted to pronounce it spindly when I see it written out, but it's spindly. You see, that makes me think of spiders, like spiders or spindly, spindly. <laughs> anyway, and and Giannis, I think, is so Giannis posted up last last season about six times per 100 possessions. That was mm-hmm. like 
That's about LeBron and Kawhi frequency. Now, LeBron, we know, can dial it up in the playoffs, and if he needs to, he can post up every single possession. Um, I think Giannis can get in there more, and I think he can improve as a scorer, and I think if he improves as a scorer, he'll also improve as a playmaker because he'll get more double teams. He'll he'll begin to digest the reads a little easier because, I mean, one of the interesting things about the Bucks and their pursuit of Drew Holiday and their whatever of Bogdan Bogdanovich. That um, thing, yeah. It, yeah, that thing that happened um, is I think they've realized that we need not just more shooting, we need more playmaking because Giannis as an alpha playmaker is only so good. We need mm. other guys who can break down the defense, who can throw next level passes. Drew's a good passer. I think Bogdanovich is actually maybe a better passer than Drew or about as good. Um, they didn't get him, obviously. And I think that was one of the directions they took in the offseason. But I also think Giannis has, uh, he's only 26. And, and as you said, his game and his body have changed dramatically in short periods of time. I do think he has another level to get to as a playmaker that would really help their team. And, and inside-out playmaking should should be a big part of it. Well, and I think he knows that. I think that he is a guy, and and really, you know this, Zach, that this shouldn't be necessarily taken for granted for players in this league. He is someone who turns things in on himself. When things go poorly, Giannis is the person who says, okay, where did I fail here? He's not necessarily the one to blame everybody else around him. So he's looking at, okay, how can I make this easier? How can I make this better? And if you need any more evidence of those shortcomings, it's what has happened in the playoffs. It's because that takeover mode hasn't quite evolved yet because he is still figuring out what that takeover mode means if someone builds a wall like we've seen over and over and over again in the playoffs. So if those skills that you're talking about evolve, that's when we're going to see not just two-time MVP Giannis, that's when a championship potential Giannis is going to emerge. Look, people, people, every time we go on shows or podcasts, people ask like, what is Giannis going to do? And I was like, I'm always like, well, if I knew, don't <laughs> you think I'd, re- some I'd, big report, secret. Yeah. I'd report the story? <laughs> so I, I, have, I have no idea. So I'll ask you like this. Are you surprised it hasn't happened yet? Yes and no, which I realize is a cop-out answer. That's a cop, the, the, the only answer is like, <laughs> if again, if we knew, we'd know. We don't know. I am going to revert back to the, you know, story that – Milwaukee fans have um, pointed fingers at me for when two years ago I reported that for Giannis, the most important thing, you know, aside from from his family, but on the basketball court, it is winning. And I know that sounds like, well, water is wet, Malika, but no, no. What I meant and what I reported and what I had talked to folks about is for Giannis, he has a singular focus on being the best. And tangible proof in the pudding evidence of moving towards the direction he wants to see would be a finals appearance or feeling solidified in the fact that he was on a team that was finals, very least conference finals, but finals bound, because that would be building on what happened two years ago where they lost to Toronto in the conference finals. And so why I am not surprised is that that he is taking this time to be so deliberate and think so much is because Giannis is so competitive. He just so desperately wants to see unequivocally without any hesitation. He is on a team that he knows with the, this percent of certainty can make the conference finals and finals in the East this year now. And the Bucks were aggressive in the offseason. What happened with Bogdan Bogdanovich happened. But I would not be surprised that he's looking at this roster and weighing that. Why I am a little bit surprised that it hasn't happened one way or another yet is, yes, he also really does love Milwaukee. That is true. And I've said this before. What he was looking for was for everything, for three things to be on the same side. His love of Milwaukee the potential he sees for winning and the fact that this is a guy who is loyal, perhaps, you know, of of any player, if there's the highest 
echelon, the top echelon of, of, of loyal players, he might be in it with, you know, the Dame Lillards of the world, right? He wanted all three of those things to align, but potentially because they haven't, that's sort of where, where he's kind of weighing this. And I know he is defaulting a lot to his agent, Alex Saratsis, who's helping him make this decision, but that's where my yes and no comes from. The want to win with the love for Milwaukee that he's sort of balancing out here. And Giannis doesn't do anything half-assed. Giannis doesn't want to... Um, you know, the mentality that I've seen from him over the years has led me to believe that he doesn't want to necessarily just go in and, and sign something that he would, you know, people say, well, he could sign and then ask for a trade later. Giannis wants to go in with the intention of winning it for Milwaukee. That's who he is. That's the kind of player and person that he is. And if that's the overriding, I mean, we all make decisions and there's usually one thing that just mm-hmm. overwhelms everything else, right? And if that overwhelms everything else, that affection for the franchise in the city, then the decision is going to flow from there. Uh, he does love Milwaukee. I don't know Giannis well. I've talked to him a few times here or there. Um, we talk to people who know him. They all say he does love Milwaukee. He loves he it. Loves the city. Not just He doesn't just love it because the team drafted him and gave him a chance. Some team was going to do that in the draft range that the Bucks did it, right? He does legitimately love the city. Um, the thing that's interesting to me is, the Bogdanovich thing was interesting. There were reports, and you can speak to the veracity. I, I I don't even remember anymore that he that clearly he had some interest in playing with Bogdan Bogdanovich, whether he recruited him directly or whatever. Otherwise, I don't think they would have pursued him so aggressively. Um, he has not been one to do that. He has not been one to go out and say, "I want that guy. I want that guy. I want that guy." And, and so, what, why I'm mentioning that is the thing that I I don't have a good handle on is how much he values being the undisputed face of a franchise. By far the best player, the guy that is is the, is the reason it all exists. A couple of years ago, a year ago, I, I had heard that was really valuable to him. He liked that. He liked mm-hmm. that there was that it was his team and his franchise, and that would mitigate against a move to, I mean, any other franchise, you're now joining something else, right? You're joining something that was built maybe with you in mind, but you didn't build it. There are a couple teams like... Um, I, I think Dallas is the obvious one that he would not be the face of the franchise in Dallas ever. He might be the co-face of the franchise, but that tandem together, forget about it. I mean, shut it down for a couple of years. They would be ridiculous. All of these things are interesting to me. I don't know if any of that resonates with you, my characterization of Bogdanovich, et cetera. But like, I, I don't know the guy. So all I can do is sort of get that little tidbits of intel here or there. And I, and I right. still don't feel like I know him that well from those perspectives. You know... So with with Bogdan, from what I have been told, and this comes back to the competitive, you know, side of him that I wrote about, it's that in the, I think I believe it was the World Cup, but in in one of those competitions, Giannis saw Bogdan and thought, you know what, that 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 over there is that's a, it's not just how he plays, it's it's the work ethic and that he torched that that he was really great um and that you know Giannis the way that it has been told to me um was just impressed by that it was like I I can see our competitive you know us going at it he's impressing me from my he's he's impressing my need for competition and that is is what attracted Giannis to to a player like him I actually haven't thought that much about or ever I've never asked Giannis if he if he values being the face of a franchise. I would imagine from a a human nature standpoint that that is a a heck of a feeling and if that is the only experience you've ever had whether or not you realize that you like it it's something that you've grown accustomed to. I'm not sure how allergic he is to the idea of not being that. Obviously we saw um, and I'm always leery of this because I don't speak Greek as much as I've tried to learn a couple of phrases here and there. But we saw um, some translations come out of a, a Greek interview he did where he would say he he said he would welcome stars coming to Milwaukee to play with him. That's he right, just wants to win, right? So that makes me think, okay, maybe he's at the point in his career now where 
he's done it. He's he's been the face. Maybe if he bring someone else in is is at this point does it it goes back to that scale is winning going to win out is winning going to win out over being the face of something is winning going to win out over um you know that that that's sort of the the calculation that I would imagine because like I said I've never asked him that he would be making the other thing you know I- I understand he can sign the exact same contract after the season. He's already eligible, yeah. but he could go on the beach all year and still be super max eligible after the season. Correct. Um, so that that sort of decreases the pressure of this one moment a little bit. Mm-hmm. But I do wonder if he. It is hard to navigate life on a championship on a team with championship ambitions with that hanging over your head all year long. And that's another thing. I just wonder. Does he have, I don't, the stomach for it is the wrong word. Like, is he ready for that question every two game losing streak? Are his teammates, is he ready to see his teammates asked about it after a four game losing streak? After they go down 1 0 in the second round of the playoffs, mm-hmm. like, is he, is that the scrutiny of that would be pretty heavy? And, you know, there's also, like, Bobby Marks has brought this up. There's also the middle ground he could play of like he could just sign a two year extension and split right. the difference. He could sign that now. I think I believe he could sign it into the season and just say I've made some commitment, but not the whole thing. And the pressure's still on, and I can come back into free agency when I have ten years of experience. I can get the big max. So there are a lot of balls in play. But like you ask some of the people who have lived with that in their final year when there were rumblings like KD in 2016 and on and mm-hmm. on. Like it's not easy. Like it's 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 tiresome. It's stressful. And I actually wonder. I, I wonder less about about Giannis. I do think that he's he's so good at just kind of saying what he wants to say and deflecting the rest. He's actually, um, you know, his 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 media day availability. He was very good at that sort of saying over and over again. This is a decision between John Horst, the front office, and and Alex Saratsis. But I do. I can already see. It, it goes back to the watching other people run versus him having to run himself. It's, it's putting that on his teammates. It's, it's that pressure that I could see um, affecting him or bothering him because he does care more about that, about them. That's, that's where I see it's, it's the drill in the gym all over again of it's not about me and what I get asked it's it's about how this is going to affect my teammates and how they are going to be dealing with this all season long. I don't think that that weighs into his final decision. He'll make the best decision, you know, as he says for himself and his family. That's the line that players always go to. But it's less about having us himself having that stomach. It's more about other people that he's around. Um, and also you don't know till you've been through it. I'm, I'm sure that's something that you can think or say you're prepared all you want for, but then you go through it and you don't know until you know. Well, look, everyone should read your story because it's a window into what makes him tick. And uh, I, I don't want to reveal any more of it because people should go click on it and read it. It's really fun and outstanding. The one thing I will say is that I was very excited that the card game Uno came up <laughs> and his serious, don't reveal it, but his seriousness about Uno is ridiculous. Uh, his his props are ridiculous. Um, <laughs> yes. And I enjoyed every second of that. My question to you, Malika, is... Uh, People, people look at Uno as just a simple game of luck, mm. like very very minimal strategy, right? Very mm-hmm. minimal strategy. Do you believe there are sophisticated Uno strategies? If you dabbled in Uno, do you believe? Do you have some core principles that you adhere to to make yourself an elite championship level Uno player? I do. I consider myself a Uno dabbler, though. Like you said, I'm not a I'm not an Uno champion, but. You don't want it. You don't want it enough, I guess. I don't. I mean, clearly, I don't want to reveal too much about my my own Uno strategy in case you know you and I ever play. But I I believe that the power cards, if you will, those are the ones you don't you don't just want to you don't necessarily want to give those up as you go. Those are ones that in the end, when it comes down to it, they can those can be real powerful. I think there's there's a little str- there's luck involved. Don't get me wrong. The deck has power, but. There's strategy to Uno and for Giannis, Kyle, Kyle Korver in the story um, <laughs> talking about how they've imported um, uh, 
the Hawks version of Uno, where there are mm-hmm. more wilds and draw twos and all that. In the and he has some quote like, "There's a lot of fire in the deck." Yeah, oh, I yeah, texted Kyle. <laughs> I texted him. I was like, "I'm literally cackling out loud at you <laughs> describing." the fact that there's a lot of fire in the deck like I, there's a lot of fire in this uno deck like it's freaking uno man there's not it's not like this let's let's tone it let's tone down the semantics a little bit and it's um, not thousands of dollars of uno the bets here are are pretty small <laughs> a lot of fire a lot of draw four fire i think so you can count cards which is like that requires a certain mental stamina that rarely do i have the t- like uno just doesn't matter yeah, yeah, but you can count cards yeah, but you're right. I think the number one error people make in Uno is using wild cards mm-hmm. too soon yep. because they don't want to draw from the pile. Like, just draw three cards from the pile, save yeah. your wild. Because when you have Uno, you got to, it's so, you're, you're like, you won't win unless you have a wild card. You well, will that's when everyone's when you, coming after you. They're coming yeah. after you when they see you're coming down to it. You need to be able to, to give it back to them when they're coming to you. So I am, whenever they're ready to, Open this up to 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 reporters, Zach. I think you and I might need to to get an inside look at this this Bucks Uno game. Yeah, and I'll I'll say this: on vacation two summers ago, I had an eight year old nephew. He's getting a little cocky about Uno. He's getting a little <laughs> cocky, so I started to bring my A game. In we had we had a four person game. It was me, a couple uncles, a nephew, an eight year old, and a teenager who was very good. Started to bring my I started counting cards, and I started playing with with a minimal Uno strategy. He wasn't so cocky anymore after a few games, okay? You couldn't just let him have it. You couldn't just let the eight-year-old win. No, I couldn't. He was he was getting a little overconfident, and it, and I and I had to. And there was nothing so satisfying. He's strategizing. Oh, what does he have? Zach has Uno. Does he have blue? Does he have red? Bam! Here's a draw four, <laughs> sucker. Take four cards, and I win. How about yeah. that? That's okay. how I imagine. Yes. Yeah. Oh, you'd fit, I definitely will you'd say, fit right in. Let's say that. Say you would bam. fit right in. I, I will say I will say exactly. I will say, bam, <laughs> take four cards, sucker, get up and go to the bar and get a beer on the beach. That is exactly how I end the Uno game. Because you I want to join the grand Because going club. to the bar to buy a beer is a way of rubbing it in how much time the other three players have left to finish the game because they have so many cards while <laughs> I'm out. I have time before the next game. Anyway, Malika. Uh, read the story. It's an outstanding story. Few people know the Bucks and Giannis as well as you do. And welcome back from the bubble and uh, enjoy the beginning of the NBA season. Malika Andrews, everybody. Thank you. Thanks, Zach.